for uh, attending our Tech Insider update for quarter two of 2022. Um, just to kind of go over a little bit of housekeeping items, first and foremost, this webinar is being recorded, so please take note of that. Um, also, as it is a webinar, uh, every all attendees will be muted. So if you have any questions, please use the chat feature to be able to answer, ask those questions. And you can ask them at any time throughout the presentation. Um, we will also have some time at the end for a uh, question and answering session. Um, also at the end, we will have a survey for everyone to fill out. It'll be a very short survey. Um, if you fill that out, you'll be entered into a gift card drawing, as well as you receive a copy of the slide deck that we'll be sharing today. Um, for those of you who are new, just a little bit about Journey Team. Um, we're over 115 uh, 50 employees. Um, we've been doing this for about 29 years. And as you can see, um, we have a lot of happy customers work on a lot of projects and we have a lot of gold uh, and silver competencies from Microsoft. Um, from a, a reward a award standpoint, Journey Team, we've, we've been a multi, multiple time winner of Microsoft's Partner of the Year. Um, we've been voted best places to work many times many times and are currently a Microsoft inner circle partner, which means that we get to get some uh, insight into what Microsoft's working on and be able to provide feedback to them kind of before that gets out announced out to the rest of the world. So we, we usually have a pretty good pulse on what's happening within Microsoft. From a services standpoint, um, we cover across the Microsoft stack. Um, we have dedicated teams that focus on ERP, on CRM, on Azure and Microsoft 365, on collaboration and content, data and BI, and then we also do a focus a lot on change management and adoption. And this slide kind of gives you an overview of all the things that we, we help our customers with. Um, with that, um, a couple of announcements to, to share with you all. Um, first and foremost, we've recently released some new uh, support offerings. We've got three support plans um, where we can um, after completing projects, or even if you've had a project you've completed with, with someone else, and you want some ongoing support to make sure that everything works as expected, or to get, you know, make sure that, that users understand how to use the system, we have some dedicated plans that you can use from there, as well as some additional offerings if you want um, additional guidance to make little changes and tweaks and adjustments and improve your environment, as well as even if you want a dedicated engineer to help you truly maximize everything you're getting out of your out of the system. In addition to that, we also at the request of many customers have come up with a cloud managed service provider offering as well. So things where uh, some base offerings that allow you to be able to get a lot of value, no matter the size of the company you are, all the way up to where we're doing a lot more hands on support and and management of your of your environment um, for your end users. So for both our managed uh, services provider offering and our support agreement, if you're interested in learning more about those, please fill that or add that on your survey response, um, as well as reach out to your, your Journey Team account executive, and we'll be sure to get you more information on that. All right, by way of kind of introducing our presenters today, uh, my name is Mark Mickelson. Um, I've been your host so far. Um, today, we're also gonna be hearing from Kip Sorensen, our content collaborations director, Brandon Gordon, our Customer Relationships Management Director, Eric Roff, who leads our Cloud Solutions Practice, um, uh, Jim Hill, who is our Business Intelligence Consultant, um, Chase Pollard, a Business Intelligence Developer, and Alan Wilcox, one of our Senior ERP Architects. And our agenda is gonna go as, as follows. We're gonna start off hearing from about Teams updates, move to OneDrive, Power BI, some Cloud and Office 365 updates, talk about a Power BI app for Dynamics 365 Business Central, cover Azure AD, Dynamics 365 CRM, Exchange Online, talk about some updates with Yammer and help further educate you on Viva, talk about Microsoft Unified Endpoint Manager, some things to know about Dynamics 365 Finance and Supply Chain, and then we'll wrap up with some SharePoint updates. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Kip um, to talk to us about Teams. Thanks, Mark. So we're gonna go ahead and dive into some pretty fun features that a lot of clients are kind of excited about. They are a little bit fluffy on the edges, but nonetheless, they're great tools to help us to be able to collaborate, present better, 
uh, within our organization. So first around Microsoft Teams, we are getting some additional updates. If you haven't seen these already, uh, you will get them later this month is around the presenter mode. So if you guys remember when we're able to share our screen, you could have an overlay of your webcam and it was kind of a fixed size. So now you have the ability to change the size of the actual presenter that's being overlaid and you can move it from the left side to the right side of the screen, depending on the content that you're presenting. You also have the ability to pin and hide your own video from your view, not from other people's view, but from your view. So if you're presenting and you want to hide your webcam because it's distracted or whatever, you can actually pin it and or hide it. Um, we have some new forms, apps, and polls that are within Teams. We presented on this, I think, last tech update. Um, we're now getting a cloud, uh, word cloud poll as an option. We have additional mute notification options. And then the together mode that a lot of us have used for like all hands meetings and larger organizational meetings, we have some additional changes to those. You have some additional scenes and you can enforce that together mode view for everyone in the meeting. Before it was just for your, you know, your presentation layer. So now you can actually move the meeting over to together mode. Other additional updates around Microsoft Teams, around collaboration. Um, so your chats on the left-hand side, you can actually have some filters and now we have some options. So you can filter down your chats by unread chats, meetings, apps, and muted. So you can get to meetings if you, for instance, a really common use case here is we recorded that meeting and where's the recording, right? So you can come here, filter down by meetings or to the meetings chat. So a really handy feature there. There are shared channels um, before you, and a shared channel is, I'm gonna some, say it in a very simplistic way that's gonna be inaccurate, but shared channels is external access to a secure team through just a channel. Before you get too excited about that though, do reach out to us and we can explain exactly what's happened on the back end. Roth and I, I think, are both a little bit in agreement. We're not quite sure this is 100% prime time or should, should be carefully considered before being turned on within your tenants. And we can talk about that with you guys and, and show you what we've uh, identified on our side, okay? Amen. You get suggested replies in chats. So um, if you're really bad at communicating like I am, uh, now I just hit the pre uh, predefined chat replies and um, everyone thinks I'm listening to them. <laughs> so really great stuff. Uh, notification drawer uh, within iOS, uh, local time is now added on contact cards. So this is actually kind of cool. So if you click on a contact, like uh, the or the little like notificator uh, or the icon of the individual, and we've seen that common contact card throughout the interface, it now includes that user's time zone. And then we also have some UI adjust adjustments to the chat to make it more stacked so it's more dense and you can see more chats. It doesn't look as good from a UI perspective, but if you need to see more content uh, on a single screen, that chat density setting is pretty handy. All right, let's hop into OneDrive. Um, I just have a few OneDrive updates for you guys, nothing too crazy. Um, and to be, well, I, I should always, well, I'm going to share my opinion anyway. You know, Microsoft bloody, muddies this water a little too much between OneDrive and collaboration. And I think a lot of these features actually generate more confusion than not. But regardless, here's some updates. So you can actually pin your shared libraries, libraries that have been shared with you, and you can pin them within the OneDrive interface for quick access. So that's pretty slick. The other thing, if you guys haven't noticed already, SharePoint document libraries, when you navigate to them, it now has a drop down list off to the top of the library name. And you can actually have this quick navigation in between the libraries within that given site. That same functionality has been added to OneDrive. And so now when I'm in OneDrive, I can see those SharePoint libraries that are associated to a standard Teams chat as well as private channels and quickly navigate into between those libraries from the OneDrive interface. Pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And then the last update is Microsoft making it a little bit easier for you to switch between your personal OneDrive 
and your OneDrive for business in the event that um, you know, you've been authenticated in between the two. And now you can kind of switch between the interface a little bit easier. And that's it that I have on the OneDrive side. Okay. Hi, my name is Jim Hill, and I'm part of our data and business intelligence team here at Journey Team. Power BI is an awesome product, and it keeps growing. Every month, Microsoft is adding new features and capabilities, way more than I can highlight here today, but I'm going to highlight a few of those that I think will be beneficial to you. So the first update I want to talk about is a change to the visualization pane. This went into preview a few months ago, but now is in general availability. So if you update your version of Power BI on your desktop, you'll start seeing these changes to the visualization pane. So what you're going to see is two different new submenus. The one on the left here is showing the visual submenu, and the one on the right shows the general submenu. What they've done is made an attempt to kind of standardize across visualizations where you find things. It allows for a little less scrolling. It also puts things in a more consistent place and hopefully creates where you have to do less clicking. So that's the new visualization pane. The next thing I want to highlight is goals. Goals is a feature that was introduced a few um, quarters back. It's only available up on the Power BI service. There's an actual menu item for goals. And this is something that allows you to create individual or team goals that can be tracked. Some of the new features that are a tie into team notifications. So an example is if you have a, um, a new person assigned to a goal, they'll get a notification in teams. Or if a status of one of your goals changes, that notification will come out to you as well. Another nice feature that they've added to goals is the ability to have more than one owner on a goal. So if you have multiple people working on something, they'll all get notified. And then you also have the new capability. You can create a scorecard using goals in your own My Workspace. So it doesn't have to be done in the managed workspaces. You can experiment with this in your own My Workspace. All right, another really cool new feature is the ability to optimize your layout for mobile. The mobile view layout is a cool feature in Power BI. It lets you grab any of the visuals and arrange them on a page. In the past, you had very little flexibility other than where you put it on the, the layout and how big you made it. Now, as you can see, they've added a visualization uh, customization on the right. So when you select the visual, you can change fonts, size, color, the way it's aligned. You can also change effects or headers, a variety of different things. Really powerful. And you'll notice there's a new little icon there in the visualization for the mobile layout that lets you turn it on or off in case you want to clear the customizations and just take the ones that came in from the desktop layout. Uh, there's a handful of other good ones I want to just briefly highlight. The first one is there is an update to the Azure map visual. Um, it no longer needs to have a longitude and latitude. Now, this is a preview feature, so you'll have to go into preview to turn this on, but it allows you to use regular address pieces uh, to land things on your visualization map. The multi card selector now has the ability to high, click on elements in that card and have them filter or cross highlight other visuals in your in your page. So that's a nice feature. Tool tips have been added to certain attributes or certain visualizations like the matrix, the line, the area charts. What this means is when you hover over something that has a tool tip, it'll pop up the, the tooltip values, but also the ability to drill down and drill through right off of the tooltip. Nice feature. Um, label updates have also been applied. This is where you can put in sensitivity um, statuses on your objects in your workspace. So if it's confidential, for example, 
they've added inheritance. So all of the things in the lineage will also show that at sensitivity level. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is error bars. On certain charts, especially the line charts in the past, you could add a fixed goal line at a certain value. You could put in a trend line, but you really couldn't add other custom lines. They've added the capability through the, the farthest menu on the right in that um, in the visualization pane you can get to this error bars. It's a preview feature you'll have to turn on as well. It will be general availability soon, I believe, but this gives you the ability, especially people who build control charts, they'll be able to add these custom lines that reflect a measure you created. So if you wanna put in standard deviation ranges on your control charts, this is how you do it. That's it. All right, I'm up. I've got a whopping one slide, but I'm going to slip in a little hidden secret as well. So first thing as far as an M365 goes, um, this is kind of a new interesting feature that Microsoft has rolled out. We've all heard of Net Promoter Score surveys that we send out. A lot of times those are for our customers to see how we're doing, et cetera. Journey Team does this. Um, Microsoft has incorporated the ability to send your end users NPS surveys. OK, about how your M365 uh, world is doing and what their experience has been working inside your M365 tenant. And so kind of an interesting concept, right, that they've got the framework to do NPS to your end users inside your own tenant. OK, and you get feedback from end users about what they like and things like that. So um, be aware of that. Another little thing I didn't get in the slide deck, but I just want to mention if you're in Word online or Excel online, you can now sign in to another Office 365 identity and switch identities inside Word online or T or uh, SharePoint or uh, Excel online inside the Office apps for the online version. OK, so a couple of quick updates there on the cloud and just general M365 stuff, and uh, I'll be back for more. All right, we've got Power BI is up next, Business Central. All right, so what we did is we now offer at Journey Team what we call Business Central Reporting Package. And what that allows you to do is we can connect now to your Business Central instance. We can go in and grab all of that data. Uh, what it has first is a core data model. Uh, we spent over a thousand hours implementing this. Um, and it now allows us to go in and at a fixed rate, pull in your data into Power BI. Business Central has reporting. It's very stagnant. It's You aren't allowed to drill through and find out the problems and anomalies that are happening in your data. And now with, with this um, reporting package, you can go in, integrate it into Power BI, and, um, and you can now find uh, the anomalies and problems with interactive reports that are coming through in the Power BI. Um, and on the basic, with this reporting package, we've included basic reports um, such as balance sheet, income statement, trial balance. Um, we have some, and we can show the slides yet. Um, you can see these um, basic reporting reports that come with this reporting package. Um, and this is just scratching the surface. The best thing that comes with this reporting package is the ability to have all of your data flow into Business Central. And that allows you to go in and you can create your own reports off this, off your BC data to um, manage your company how you need. And um, we can also do customizations with this. Uh, so if you choose, we can go in and, and build individual customizable reports for you aside from these six different reports. Um, and we can also train you on how to do that. Um, so it's a really cool reporting package. Please reach out if you have any questions and we can get you some um, some more information on what that fixed cost is based on the difficulty of how it, how it runs. So. All right, you've, uh, you've all been waiting for Azure AD updates, I know. Um, a bunch of cool stuff coming up here. Um, this is the combined security registration feature. Basically, in the past, Microsoft would have people enroll with multi-factor and enroll with self-service password reset, and they were two different experiences. 
if we've got a tenant health check for you, this is one of the first things we go turn on. Uh, don't just go check the button though, because if your SSPR is enabled and you check this, now you've got people having to go through SSPR. Um, and so you wanna be aware of the pieces of the puzzle that turn this on. But any, since August of uh, 2020, any new tenants have had this turned on. Uh, September of this year, it's going on for everybody. So be aware of that, um, that this is coming. It's a very good thing. Um, and it gives you a significantly better user experience as they go through MFA enrollment, which now bundles the self-service password reset enrollment with that. Doesn't necessarily mean they can do SSPR, but because it's one enrollment experience, they are set up and ready to go for that if you choose to have SSPR as part of your offering there. Okay, so be aware of that. Good stuff there. Next is, um, one of my favorite features, this is a game changer, everyone. So if you've been working with Journey Team and you're on a project and we have you as a guest user in our tenant because you're part of a team and you're collaborating with us, right? You've loved this because we secure our tenant and you've had to enroll in Journey Team's multi-factor authentication. What we can now do is we can trust MFA coming out of your own tenant as you access resources in our tenant, for example. Uh, this is part of the new external identities framework that Microsoft is rolling out, and uh, it's very simple to turn on. Uh, we have enabled this in our Journey Team tenant, and so if you're a guest user and you're interacting with us now, you can we will trust your own MFA. If you don't have MFA in your own home tenant, you will be prompted to enroll it before you can access a Journey Team resource in our tenant. So this applies to any tenant to tenant, cross tenant, B to B collaboration that's going on. Um, the ability to trust the MFA state, not just MFA, but compliant devices is on the list and hybrid Azure AD join devices. So some great knobs and buttons here um, about trust settings across uh, external collaboration between tenants. So I'm not going to get into the B2B collaboration um, there, but uh, there's more stuff behind that door. That's the easy thing behind that door. Um, all right, administrative units in Azure AD. If you don't know what an administrative unit is, um, don't feel bad. They're they're kind of these little uh, minor used anomalies out there. But because they have this feature now, I see an uptick in how these are going to be leveraged in, in organizations. Um, these are maturing enough so now we can support the auto population of the membership of an administrative unit. These are kind of like um, organizational units inside Active Directory where you can logically separate an audience of people into this container, if you will. Uh, Azure calls them administrative units, and now the membership of those can be dynamically populated based off user or group, or user or device, excuse me, okay? Um, so that allows you to delegate administration across the business for Azure AD users and groups and devices, okay? So if you've got a pocket of people that want to manage these people and these devices, you can delegate that administration through this administrative unit framework, and then those people can do that, but they can't manage the whole tenant. They can just manage their little group of people or devices. That's the whole point of administrative units. Pretty slick feature now. All right, coming up after that, we've got um, this new report that you can pull to get your uh, history on access reviews. So access reviews, if you have no idea what this is, it's because you may not have Azure AD P2. This is a identity governance feature um, to, re to perform an access review on who has access to something or who's in this group's membership or who has this administrative role. You have to have P2 and they've now matured this so you can get this nifty little report that tells you what actions were taken by the reviewer, uh, what times, uh, what types of uh, reviews were taking place and those kind of things. So if you're doing or looking at identity governance, um, this is a slick little update there for viewing that history report. Okay. Uh, after that, we've got uh, another one of my favorites, something I've been waiting for for two years on. Ever since Microsoft rolled out passwordless authentication, um, which I'm a big fan of, that means when I log into Office 365, I don't have to type a password, okay? And um, that uses the Microsoft Authenticator app as part of that process. I put my username in, it sends me a push, I have to uh, type in a number to match what's showing on the screen. I now see the, a map of where that login event is coming from inside the Authenticator app, that's all there today. And I could only historically do passwordless on one identity. So as a consultant, this was painful because I've got lots of accounts with different customers and I had to do my password with MFA every time. 
So now I can enable those accounts to do true password lists, and uh, I don't have to even plug in my credential when I log into that. That's an update coming on the Authenticator app. Um, it's in, if you're doing test flight, you can get it today, but it should be coming out by end of this month for general availability on the Authenticator app. So look for an update there. You do have to still go enable it inside the Microsoft Authenticator. You have to enable phone sign on. That's the key word to get that turned on. All right. Um, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps, uh, MDA is what you may see it as an acronym. It used to be called Microsoft uh, Cloud App Security. Um, what, you know, more name changes in Microsoft. This has been name changed for a little bit, but this now has two new alerting policies that are built into it. Uh, mass access to sensitive files. That's not something that you want going on. OK, sensitive files and a big uh, dump or uh, some automated bot that's that's uh, getting content uh, or accessing these this content that's sensitive. So that's an alert to be triggered now in the MCAS policies um, and then a, unusual addition of credentials to an OAuth app. So these are service principles technically inside Azure Active Directory. These govern how third party apps or homegrown apps can integrate and get data out of your environment. Um, and so um, these are, if you get um, uh, credentials, there's secrets on these things, client IDs and client secrets. And so this, OAuth pol this MCAS policy will detect the suspicious activity around these service principles and help tighten that up. Um, if I was a bad guy and I wanted to get to your data, this is the door I would go through as a service principal. I would not try to get someone's credentials and use their login. I would go through this door. So this alerting policy here to look at um, service principles and how those apps integrate is uh, a great addition. Okay. Um, coming up after that, we've got Dynamics. I'll shut up and turn it over to Brandon. Okay. All right. Um, so some of the big themes for for dynamics that I'm going to be kind of covering right um, in this session is kind of just related around a lot around a lot of the Teams collaboration features. So a lot of the O365 integration with Dynamic CRM has been very impactful. So a lot of these features are in preview. Some of them you can be getting in some of your test or sandbox environments if you need preview features. So I'll be covering some of the basics. So one of them is that you can now do from within Dynamics CRM, you can have the Teams, the Teams caller and dialer embedded inside of your forms. And so it's it's a flyout window on the right. So you can make a phone call directly from Dynamics using Teams to wherever you need um, externally if you have your telephony uh, enabled. So that's really cool. And also we'll capture transcript information, no information. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, cool opportunities here related to just the Microsoft's continued focus and approach towards Teams, O365 and Dynamics and Power Apps integrations and how all these applications need and should talk to each other from a collaboration standpoint to kind of be able to offer that kind of seamless and holistic experience from an end user. Um, and I'll touch a little bit more on, on that. Um, the other, go back real quick is the the other kind of cool thing with the the not only related to the microsoft dialer from within dynamics is that dynamics is going and teams are going to be offering a simple call pop feature that you can have embedded within dynamics so if you have dynamics open in a web browser and someone calls you um, and you have telephony and voice enabled you can get a call pop-up from that browser window for that specific customer so that's really cool because it makes it makes it to where a lot of customers want a simple call pop feature without having to go through an entire telephony takeover, right? That that a lot of the other kind of larger players like contact centers uh, kind of offer. So there is kind of like a simple middle ground. Um, so you don't need to do a full takeover to be able to have some call pop features and functionalities. You can have a simple version that will come baked into Dynamics out of the box. Um, the next up, this one's this one's really cool as well. Is you know, within Dynamics, you can always create appointments and have those appointments sync into your Outlook calendar, right? For your specific customer that that appointment's tied to, as far as a record. In this case, if it was tied to this uh, 
opportunity record inside of Dynamics that'll go and you know tie to the uh, the contact their 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 calendar as well as yours. Um, the upgraded version that we knew that this is kind of coming for a while is that eventually people are going to be using Teams meetings. And so in preview, you'll be able to create Teams meetings directly from Dynamics from the timeline and be able to have meetings associated to this specific record inside of Dynamics. And so what that offers you is that you can not only have a Teams meeting tied to a specific or uh, tied to a specific team, but you can have it tied to a specific record. And so some of the additional features that you can get is that you can see record data from your Teams meeting related to that record inside of Dynamics. And so here you can see, I can see my business phone, some basic contact information. You can, uh, you get access to your timeline. So you can create notes, activities, tasks, appointments, follow, uh, phone calls, whatever you want directly from your, your summary and meeting notes from your Microsoft Teams meeting without having to be inside of Dynamics. Um, and then some additional functionalities and features is that you can also, in that second screen chat, it's a little bit harder to see, but where I have the probability highlighted is that you can edit this data from Microsoft Teams and have it sync back into Dynamics. And so um, a lot of the, the themes you can, you, can, you can see with what Microsoft is doing with Teams and Dynamics is that um, you can do most of what you want to do inside of Teams from within Dynamics, and then you can also be interacting with Dynamics from within Teams. And so those two apps are becoming more and more seamlessly tied together as far as it's just kind of a preference as far as how the users are interacting with that data, what's their use case, and kind of you know, where do you want to have your users be um, doing their work. So I think that's that's a really big feature. And next up, you could also, uh, this one's kind of just a bigger Teams meeting screenshot. You can see that you also get the transcript information that you can also have tied not only to this Teams meeting, but it's also being referenced and tied to that record set of dynamics. So next up, I've talked about this one in the last um, in the last Tech and Center update, just kind of related to the it's the the official name is the Enhanced Teams Collaboration Features inside of Dynamics, where you can have Dynamics chats linked to records inside of inside of Serum. Um, so this is just really cool. This is in preview. We've been demoing it with a lot of prospective customers and existing customers. Um, and even in preview, it's been it's been working uh, really well. And so you can have chat pop-ups. You can link specific conversations. So you could have multiple conversations, like you can see here is on this case record. I have three conversations. I have two related to bike issues, and then another one where it's a bike issues with an engineer. So you can have um, one to many conversations associated to this record inside of CRM. And anybody that has access to this record in CRM can join and participate in those linked conversations. They're not tied to security, whereas, you know, in the traditional sense, if you want to bring somebody into a Teams conversation, you go find them and you find the conversation and you add them to it. So um, that's really nifty. On top of, you can, you know, in the traditional sense that you could even do this, you know, even without this pre features, you can link Teams channels to records inside of Serum. So if you aren't, necessarily if your your processes aren't set up to be that granular the linked conversations um, is, is a great alternative to be able to kind of bridge the gap um, and so there's just lots of lots of collaboration um, potential with dynamics teams and this is kind of what a lot of people have been clamoring for and what a lot of people are getting excited about And here, just to recap, as far as some of the, the different applications and set of dynamics and power apps, um, I'll just kind of go down the list. Uh, you got sales, marketing, field service, customer service, project operations, customer voice, customer insights, sales insights, service insights, power apps, model driven, and canvas apps, related power apps, and portals. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit that kind of falls underneath this umbrella. Um, and there's a lot of different tools that can be used to solve whatever unique business and use cases that you may have. Okay, I'm back. Third time's the charm. Um, we're going to talk about Exchange Online now. So the first thing to be aware of here is a little tweak Microsoft is making around license reassignment specifically for Exchange Online. 
In the past, you had this 30 day grace window. And if you revoke the license from a user, then um, after 30 days, they would get a brand new mailbox that's got a new GUID basically associated to it. And it's a whole net new thing. Today, um, the user, if you offboard a, a user and 30 days has passed, um, they will get back the same mailbox GUID, but that may not have any content in it, but it simplifies the, on, the re onboarding. So basically, um, when you unlicense a user, Microsoft doesn't consider them as necessarily being offboarded anymore, and you can get that user's mailbox back. It may not have content. I don't want you to think that, cool, I can restore a user or bring back a user that left and it's been, you know, 60, 90 days and all their mail comes back. That's not necessarily the case, but um, they, the account with gets preserved and um, gets reattached in a simpler manner. Simpler manner. And then here's just a little screenshot of if you've got a, a, a how to remove data from a former employee, um, how to clean that out of the environment. So just uh, Microsoft standard documentation there that kind of goes along with this. So just be aware of that little minor change on license reassignment in Exchange Online. Okay, next thing, this is kind of a bigger deal, uh, ha has to do with dynamic distribution groups. These are not dynamic Azure AD groups. These are just mail DLs. Classic distribution list has nothing to do with security or Office 365 groups or anything like that. These are DLs. In the past, um, and historically, Exchange on-prem, when you would send an email to a dynamic distribution list, it would run a query at that moment of time, find the audience, send it to those people. Um, that's kind of hard to scale for a bajillion mailboxes that are in Exchange Online now. And so what Microsoft is doing is they are doing that query for you and actually populating the DL. It behaves just like dynamic Azure AD groups, but now it's applied to DLs. Okay, and Exchange will store the membership list instead of dynamically creating it at the time the message is sent. And the list will be updated every 24 hours. So when you build your dynamic distribution list and you go send an email to it immediately, don't expect it to be delivered because you got to wait for squirrels to run around in Microsoft's land to populate the membership of that DL based on the rule. Okay, so some pros and cons to it. Uh, but be aware that, that is a different architecture that Microsoft is deploying there. Okay. Next, we've got um, your last Exchange server. I've been wanting to have this conversation for seven years now. Okay, with with different customers, um, Microsoft officially supports the ability to turn off your last Exchange server and still manage recipients in Active Directory with their email addresses and proxy aliases and things like that, okay? Uh, the way they're doing this now is they give you the ability to run Exchange PowerShell modules on your own Windows 10 or Windows 11 desktop, okay? And you don't need that Exchange server for just administrative purposes. So if you've been one of our customers and you're like, I've moved all my mailboxes to the cloud and why the crap do I still have to run this exchange server on prem and I want to kill it. And I've told you, you can turn it off, but guess what? You have to go to ADSI edit or attribute editor to tweak proxy addresses. You might want to be interested in this. Okay. Um, you, uh, and just be aware, you don't want to uninstall your last exchange server because that removes things out of the active directory environment that tell it that there is no exchange here. And that breaks your ability to run the PowerShell commands because it doesn't think there's exchange. So don't uninstall your last exchange server. You literally just turn it off and now you do your administration through PowerShell. I can talk to you more about that if you're interested in that, but this is a holy cow. It took them seven years and that's just my timeline, but literally I've been waiting for this for a long, long, long time. So this is a pretty cool update. Okay. After this, we've got um, the reminder, the death of legacy protocols. This is really happening. I was on a phone call this week with a customer that has an old IMAP client that pulls mail out of a thing. And it's like, how do I deal with this? I'm like, tell them to upgrade their app. This has been, we've known about this since 2020. This is a couple years coming at least. Okay. And so this will be shutting down October 1st, 2022. Pop an IMAP, pop an IMAP access will stop unless your client understands modern authentication. Any version of Office, like Outlook and such, you're totally fine there. You shouldn't be using Pop and IMAP anyway with that, with Outlook, um, unless it's talking to something else. So SMTP support will still be there. 
If you need help getting off of your legacy protocols, identifying what they are, et cetera, we have a, a package option there. We've got workbooks that we will identify which accounts are using those and how often. We've got charts and reports that shows the burn down rate and how you need to focus on this. We've got a whole way to solve this problem for you. Um, reach out to us. We can help you with that. But this is still coming and Microsoft has kicked the can down the road three times. I don't think they're going to change the state this time. October 1st is your favorite day to break legacy protocols. All right, enough on legacy protocols. Next, we've got um, Yammer. Back to Kip. Take it away. I think the big question is everyone wants to know the Mel client that that individual was, was using with their IMAP. Was that group wise or? Uh... Um, no, it was <laughs> some third party app that has a new version, but the business can't go to it. That whole story, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Copy. Um, as a go note ahead. on that, there are some black magic workarounds that we can make a legacy protocol uh, still work to a client with doing modern on the other side. Bigger discussion to Worst have, case, but yeah. if you are in a corner and you are stuck, reach out to us, there may be an option there. Okay. Copy. All right, let's talk about Yammer and Microsoft Viva shortly right after this. So just a quick uh, Yammer updates for you Yammer people that's part of that Yammer cult. Um, so retention policies for Yammer messages, uh, that's rolling out this month. Uh, you guys are getting a dark mode. So if you liked Yammer and you were nerdy enough to enjoy dark mode, you're like on cloud nine right now. Um, and then bookmarks are now available in Yammer. There you go. There's the Yammer update. Mark was surprised I even had a conversation around Yammer. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Microsoft Viva. Um, if you guys don't know what Viva is, um, you may have been in a rock or a cave or something. So um, learn up on Viva. Uh, there's a lot of cool movement for Microsoft side. Um, I'm excited about the fifth module coming out later this year um, around um, OKRs and KPIs that integrates within Viva. We can talk about that some other time, but here's, here's the updates around the four modules that we have today, really just three updates um, around three of the modules. So the first is connections. If you guys remember Viva connections is when we expose a SharePoint internet within the Teams interface as almost like a Teams app. We have some uh, an additional web part, a top news card web part, which will just grab news, aggregates, and then presents slightly different. For many of you that may not know, there is almost, well, not almost, there is a Viva Connections mobile setup uh, that you can configure for your tenant in the event that uh, you guys are kind of moving forward with your internet living within Microsoft Teams. Viva Insights, this is the employee well-being module of Viva. Uh, we now have shared plans, focus plans. And so now instead of just booking focus time for myself within my calendar, I can actually invite my team and we can have shared focus time. It's almost like reading time for adults. So take a look at that Viva Insights shared focus time, uh, focus plans. And then last around Viva Topics, I'm super, super excited about this. So back in the day, one of the key things around Viva Topics was our ability to get the topic to topic cards uh, showing up across multiple interfaces. This is the beginning of that. So by utilizing hashtags within Outlook for the web, if I do a hashtag and then I type, I'll get a prompt and I can view or select a Viva topic based upon the hashtag that I just created. And it will make that hashtag a hyperlink for the other recipients and they can mouse over and get the topic card summary and then ultimately navigate to the topic card itself. Now, this update here I have for Outlook, um, I need to have a correction here. This hashtag capability is also coming to Microsoft Teams, I believe later this month. So it may have gotten pushed, so but it's coming close. And then lastly, we get topic insights showing up within our search and intelligence center um, within our admin areas. So we can actually see some analytics around topics showing up um, for users across search. So pretty exciting things. Um, topics is, is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. Um, and it's a great play for you organizations that are struggling with how do we have a knowledge base within SharePoint. I really feel that Microsoft Topics, 
Viva Topics is Microsoft's first big play in that area. So next up, I believe we're back to uh, Mr. Roth. Awesome, Unified Endpoint Manager, AKA Intune. Okay, so this is kind of a new thing that Microsoft's doing. Some of you may look at it and say, another way to spend money with Microsoft, then you would be right. <laughs> um, so uh, what this is, is premium add-ons is what they're calling it. Um, and so the first premium add-on they have, it's actually kind of cool. It's a little pricey in my opinion, but it gives you the ability to do remote support, remote control with a native Microsoft solution. And so instead of going out to one of the many different third-party products that you can do remote control with, this is built into Intune. It's an add-on, you can license it, and it gets pushed out there with Intune and you can do full-on remote control of the device. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a new door there. Um, like I said, there's lots of third parties that you could do this. Uh, TeamViewer has a specific Intune integration that they had offered. Um, and so this is something that we're looking at to see if that would help your uh, remote support functionality with this premium add-on. Okay. All right. Other things with Endpoint Manager. Um, for those of you that are on E3 licenses, um, we now have this auto patch service for Intune. This is a big deal. So this is the concept of um, continuous patch updates that are automatically deployed. And the uh, frequency of these patches like Patch Tuesday, that's going to start changing here. And um, you can apply these updates. Uh, it'll happen automatically behind the scenes instead of just a big patch every month or um, that, that's come along here. Okay. So, um, auto patch service for Intune that's going to continuously deploy those patches, keeping software updates on their endpoints in place. So be aware of that coming, kind of a big change there. Uh, next, we've got uh, group policy migration. This is a big deal. Uh, it's a good thing that I don't care that we can work more efficient, efficient, efficiently at Journey Team, and this saves you lots of time. When you are moving your model from administration out of group policy to native Intune managed devices, um, being able to take your GPO, import it to Intune, and then have it automatically build the policy for that is what's now available. Uh, my team has spent many hours analyzing GPOs and getting them to build policies that do the same thing in Intune. And now Microsoft has a way to automatically build that policy out based on the GPO setting. So kind of a slick update there. Um, last thing I think I have here is that update. So taking it right away to finance and supply chain, a new offering that we've got going on here. Yeah. Uh, Dan, take uh, it away. So for finance and supply chain, I want to talk about uh, warehouse management a little bit. Um, as Microsoft tries to improve its warehouse management uh, tool or offering, you know, several years ago, they purchased the intellectual property or licensed the intellectual property from Blue Horseshoe, and they've been incorporating that into uh, finance and operation warehouse management. And as part of that, there's this been a drive to expand, add more specialized and add more complicated features and functionality to the Dynamics uh, warehouse management system. And Microsoft recently did a poll with their customers and found that about 65% of their customers were intimidated by the configuration that's needed to stand up a warehouse management. And so if you hear the word warehouse light coming from Microsoft, keep in mind that it is, it is not a new product. It is a focus on what is the minimal configuration required in order to turn on a warehouse and actually use a warehouse. And those minimum, minimum configurations, you have to have a site, a warehouse, and locations within your warehouse. Then you have to have some, um, you have to have a wave and you have to have some work templates and also some location directives set up. And you can set those up in such a way that it does not require interaction with your warehouse workers. And then if you're using mobile apps, you need to configure the menu menu items for your mobile apps. But do not be intimidated by the, the breadth and the depth of the configuration items that exist in the product in order to turn on a warehouse. Uh, let's see. So the 
the current warehouse management system can, you can configure that to the smallest and most simple warehouse and then grow that with your business or grow that with the complexity of your warehouse just by configuration and it will not require a re-implementation. And you can do that by changing or adding locations, adding warehouses to sites, creating new work templates and location directors and so forth. So keep that in mind that you can have a simple warehouse that's configured for something as simple as the back end of a retail site. And you can go all the way up with the same warehouse management software to a fully automated warehouse uh, with plant floor automation, warehouse management, uh, or excuse me, material handling equipment that you want to interface with and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So just a couple of notes on that. Um, our FSC leadership, this is a new practice and it's been up for a few months now, um, but our FSC leadership has experience implementing this concept of warehouse light in uh, six of the seven continents and in many, many countries. And so we do have some experience in implementing that internationally as well. And so if you do have questions or want some more information or some help in how do you set up warehouse so I can use it in a very small, simple warehouse, uh, let us know, we'd be happy to help. All right, let's wrap up with uh, SharePoint as all the people start dropping off the call. I'm just joking. Here's, here's the reality. Anyone that doesn't like SharePoint, we have the last laugh because they're all using it once you use Teams anyway. So, you know what? <laughs> um, let's talk about these updates. And there's a lot here. Um, and for those that are utilizing SharePoint as a document management and a knowledge management platform, um, I'm really excited about some of these and I'm not excited about others. And I'll, I'll explain why. But the first one there is co-authoring. So we, we had co-authoring before. That's not the update. The update is, is that um, documents that we have sensitivity labels around for uh, that are encrypted around um, information protection, you can now co-author on, which is actually a, was a major gap once we implemented information protection. So that is a, a huge win for um, collaboration. The second uh, taxonomy column, we had taxonomy columns in the past. The UI wasn't quite updated. And so Microsoft has made some adjustments for the modern libraries to be able to allow us to modify the taxonomy column from within that modern interface. Um, we have some new list templates that are available. Um, so kind of take a look at those. Microsoft Lists now has an Android app so you can access your SharePoint list from within a single interface um, within Android. If you haven't noticed in your SharePoint sites, the app bar on the left-hand side has evolved and it now includes a lists area and another button to create a bunch of stuff all from the app bar. Um, keep in mind, if you have restricted and removed the provisions for users to provision SharePoint sites and Microsoft 365 groups, don't worry, they won't be able to do that from the app bar. It will honor that. Um, and then for everyone that might be having an internal conversation with themselves about, I sure hate that app bar, I wish we could get rid of it. We don't have options around it, not yet. Um, the top icon though on that app bar can be used as a global navigation. So kind of keep that in mind. You do have a little bit of configurations around the first icon and how that gets utilized. I don't know why I'm so excited about this, but I am. Whiteboards are now files. Not that we weren't files before, but they actually are dot whiteboard files that are stored in OneDrive and SharePoint. So when you launch whiteboard on your desktop and you start modifying, it'll actually provision a whiteboard folder in your OneDrive and that file is actually located there. And you can move that file around just like any other file. I like it. So Rob it's likes it too. It's a net new file type for Microsoft. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I dig it. Uh, comments around stream videos and audio players um, are coming in SharePoint. So if you guys remember, you can actually store, um, obviously, audio and video in SharePoint. It was using the stream video player from within SharePoint. Now the comments capability is coming. 
Uh, SharePoint Syntax has some site templates available to you now. So for those that wanted to kind of launch pad the use, uh, the use of Syntax within your environment, there's now a contracts management SharePoint site template. And for you, uh, for those listening that may not know what Syntax is, this was our ability to create a model and have that model extract data from documents when uploaded into SharePoint. So kind of the easiest use case would be, let's say, I don't know, invoices or contracts. When you upload that document to a SharePoint document library, Syntax um, model will actually look and scrub that document and extract who the customer was, the contract date, summary details, who the account rep was and et cetera, and utilize that to populate metadata in a SharePoint document library. This is a big deal, right? We've had metadata in document libraries for years and years. And the number one issue that we've always had is, let's say it together, adoption. It's always been the issue. So Syntax is doing the adoption of metadata for us. And we've done multiple labs for multiple clients around the power of Syntax. It's actually really cool. Okay, Teams conversations coming to the office.com search results, as well as SharePoint's enterprise search results. So you'll now get a search scope called conversations and you can actually access the conversations from there. And then lastly, SharePoint team sites that are associated to a team. So, all right, so SharePoint team sites have been teamified. There are unique templates around those sites and they slightly look a little bit different. So we're more, a little bit more aware that they're associated to a team on the other side of the fence. So pretty cool updates coming from SharePoint. All right, well, before we get to questions and answers, uh, just a couple of events we wanna mention as we're that coming up here in the next uh, couple months. Uh, first of all, our Business Central Sherpa program, um, next session starts on 621. And our Power App Sherpa program starts on uh, 725. Uh, reminder, our Sherpa program is a guided self-implementation um, program that helps you able to, to get those technologies up quicker, faster, and adopted faster. Um, then also, our next Tech Insider update is on August 23rd. So uh, make sure to, to block out your calendars for that day to, to join us again. With that, we've got about a minute left. Um, let's go ahead and just jump into um, questions and answers. Uh, uh, any questions you guys have? Also, just a reminder to please fill out that survey um, that I mentioned early, uh, when we started. Um, the link was shared in the chat by Jen. So um, with that, questions. Um, I believe we had one from Tony earlier about the um, the call pop and asking if it works with any telephony system in Dynamics or only like the big players. Um, Brandon Gordon, um, do you have, I know you're working on a list. Do you have that ready or is that something that we'll need to follow up with Tony on afterwards? He's going to work on that list and get back to Tony on it. Perfect. Yeah, so Tony, we'll follow up and get you a list of the ones it does work with now um, and, and doesn't. Um, he was trying to compile that quickly um, during the call. All right, um, just the other, any other question, uh, Kip, I know, Roff answered this um, in the chat uh, with one of the questions to Matt, but do you want to just give a, a brief uh, quickly on, on whether it's a good idea to use shared channels or not? It's a bad idea. Move on, Matt. <laughs> Next question. Um, I, I did post a, a response uh, in, the, in the meeting about shared channels and guest accounts and the whole tenant trust settings and stuff. So it, they... They kind of cross each other a little bit, but basically the short version is shared channels does not use a guest object in your tenant. You are off the reservation when it comes to identity management and visibility there. And when you do a shared channel, you can't put a guest user in your tenant in the shared channel. So they're kind of a one way street today. So there's some totally weird nuances with them and I would definitely be cautious about using them. And the only thing I'd add to that is when we work with clients to set up their architecture around 365 groups, this is a conversation, right? Is when do we allow guests? When don't we allow guests? And we'll often take the approach of identifying group sensitivity labels that will say anything that's classified as a department can't have a guest, right? Because we don't want accounting and finance to accidentally think they're sharing a file 
and invite someone into their group, right? And have broad access to a bunch of content. So it's really common that we'll restrict guest access, but there's needs, right? There's needs. We have the need with our clients when we typically have a project, we'll set up an external workspace and we'll collaborate with our client. So let's bucket that level of access. And by doing that, we do that through the framework of guests, not through this framework of who knows what, who knows what and just willy-nilly shared. It's, it's almost the equivalent of like an anonymous shared link to an entire channel and any chat and or file added to that channel is, is included in the anonymousness. I just made up a word. <laughs> so anonymous. No, no. Uh, doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it is a good word. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Make sure you fill out that survey. If you have any other questions, feel free, please feel free to, to send us an email. We'll be happy to get those answered for you. And uh, look forward to chatting with you again, um, seeing you again in August. Thanks everyone. <laughs>